Well, I mean, I want to start by asking Rupert a bit about that 40 years, and you can probably see exactly where I'm going from what I've just said. I want to say to Rupert, you know, what was it like then? What's it like now? Do you think things have changed? When you re-edit the book or republish it, or when you publish your other books, you are clearly better known. Do you feel that you're more inside the respectable world of the intellect? Have things improved? Well, I think they have, yes. When I first brought out A New Science of Life in 1981, the, it was a radical hypothesis where I first put forward the idea of morphic resonance, memory and nature. And in the 1980s, there was within biology a kind of triumphalist feeling that molecular biology was going to explain everything. Genes were going to explain proteins and and proteins were going to explain cells and life. And then by the late 80s it was the genome project uh, began to be f floated for the first time. And the idea was that by sequencing the human genome, we'll understand human nature uh, in molecular detail. This was very, very widely believed. And when I was an undergraduate at Cambridge, and this was in the 60s, um, Sidney Brenner and Francis Crick, who'd both got, um, you know, they cracked the genetic code, Crick had already got a Nobel Prize, um, invited me and a few other third year undergraduates who were studying biochemistry to a series of private seminars. And they explained to us that the problems of biology that remain open are development, how form develops and consciousness. And the reason they haven't been solved yet is because molecular biologists haven't yet worked on them and the people who have worked on them aren't very bright. So uh, they said within 10 years we're going to solve them or maybe 20. And, and so Crick said I'm taking consciousness and Brenner said I'm taking development. Um, and they invited us to join us. They were running these seminars to try and recruit graduate students to work with them. And indeed uh, many of my colleagues did go and work with them. I didn't because I was not persuaded of this vision. But the, they really believed that within 10 or 20 years, consciousness would be solved. And Crick did his best. Brenner did his best. He worked on a tiny nematode worm. He got the Nobel Prize for um, studying it in immense detail. We know the genome. We know the detailed anatomy. We still don't understand behavior. We still don't understand development. We still don't understand consciousness. And I think there's been a gradual realization that this isn't working. The, sol the solving of the genome project when it was announced, the human genome was announced in the year 2000, um, there was an immense disappointment. People thought that there were going to be 100,000 genes. You were going to have specific genes for all sorts of things. You'd be able to patent them and make a fortune. Turned out we only had about 20,000 genes, less than a sea urchin, about half as many as a rice plant. And um, that um, people couldn't make fortunes. And Craig Venter, who had the private genome company, uh, um, Seller of Genomics, um, found the share price crashed from about $45 a share to about nine cents because the markets realized this just wasn't going to go anywhere. And at least he has a sense of humor. In an interview afterwards, he said, I'm a guy who's made a million dollars the hard way by working my way down from a billion. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, so there was uh, the, the then there's the missing heritability problem came up a few years later. It turned out that genomes didn't explain more than about 10 percent of most forms of inheritance. Things like schizophrenia, breast cancer, it's less than 10 percent height. It's just a little bit more than 10 percent. But that means that most of inheritance is unexplained. And this is called the missing heritability problem. Um, and meanwhile, the recognition of the so-called hard problem in consciousness studies um, has led to people realizing that you're just not going to be able to explain the existence of consciousness by doing more brain scans or doing more neurophysiology or studying more, more neurotransmitters. And meanwhile, um, the, there's been, thanks to people like Pim van Lommel, there's been a great growth in consciousness studies where people, instead of studying behavioristic reflexes, as many did in the 20th century, 
have looked at the actual phenomena of consciousness, including near-death experiences, mystical experiences, psychedelic experiences. Um, and it's become clear that this goes way beyond a narrow mechanistic roadmap. So I think that for all these reasons, there's been a, a general opening up in, in the realm of possible scientific debates. And the hard problem has led to a rise in panpsychism, which has now become quite fashionable within the academic world, which is would have been very surprising 40 years ago. I mean, panpsychism was a, a tiny minority position and most people had never even heard of it. And those who had, probably belong to things like the Theosophical Society or small esoteric groups, but not um, mainstream academic philosophers. So I think all of these things have led to uh, uh, an opening up. Uh, there's still within the world of science, there are still very strong taboos. You still can't mention the word telepathy without derision uh, in most universities. Um, there are, there's uh, still a very intolerant atmosphere about some of these prohibited areas but privately many scientists are much more open to them even if in public they still observe the conventional taboos so you i mean really you're saying that there's been a crack in the dike or something that there's a, there's some opening for for the more open mind uh, but it, 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 somehow I, we feel a little bit cheated, don't we? Because, I mean, I only recently realised that Max Planck, I mean, Max Planck uh, had said that consciousness was primary. I mean, and lots of these people, I mean, were, were they hiding or were we, was it concealed from us? Or Well, a lot of um, the physicists, quantum, founders of quantum th physics, I mean, Niels Bohr mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and Schrodinger and Heisenberg had rather broad philosophical views and um, d d did think of consciousness as important or primary. Um, I think that in some ways you see physics has opened up from the quantum revolution and relativity revolution through the 20th century up till today. Physics has been opening up. There's been, you know, cosmology, the Big Bang cosmology, evolutionary cosmology. Now many physicists think in terms of multiverses. They recognize that 95% of the universe is utterly unknown to us, dark matter and dark energy. Um, I mean, this is the official view that 95% of it is dark matter and dark energy, and we haven't a clue what they are. So are they conserved? Is the total amount always the same? Uh, what are the properties? Can they be converted into regular matter and energy? Nobody knows. It's as if physics has discovered the cosmic unconscious. Um, so we've got, uh, and and they talk in terms of multiverses, super string theory has 10 dimensions. Again, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, uh, people working in psychical research used to say things like, well, maybe there's an extra dimension which could help explain these things. Well, in modern physics, extra dimensions come cheap. Um, there's just lots of them. Uh, so physics has opened up in many ways, but biology went in the opposite direction in the 20th century. At the beginning of the 20th century, there was um, a strong vitalist movement where people thought there was more to life than just physics and chemistry. Um, Bergson's the theory of memory not being stored in brains and uh, and of course Henry Bergson was a member of the Society for Psychical Research indeed a president of it. Hans Driesch the great vitalist biologist was also a president of the SPR um, and the, there was also a widespread interest in memory in life and the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Now by the 1920s things began to change and biology began to move into a narrow tunnel of dogmatic materialism where in psychology behavior and behaviorism took over saying we disregard consciousness it's a pseudo-scientific concept you know we just look at measurable responses reflexes salivary secretions and so forth um, so in psychology there was an attempt to study the mind while denying or ignoring consciousness. Um, within biology, the vitalism was treated as an appalling heresy that had to be stamped out and the last nails knocked into its coffin.
Um, scientists like that kind of language, you know, when the, the things they don't agree with, they talk in terms of knocking the last nails into the coffin of vitalism. And um, the inheritance of acquired characteristics became the principal heresy in Western biology. And then neo-Darwinism took over with this very narrow gene-centered view, evolution's about chance mutations and the selection of group gene frequencies. And it's all about genes. And this is the Richard Dawkins selfish gene type neo-Darwinian view. So biology was moving in that direction. And then with the genome sequencing and then biotechnology, genetic engineering, all these highly mechanistic ways of thinking of life became almost overwhelming in biology. When I was an undergraduate at Cambridge in the 60s, um, in the botany department, where I studied botany there, and in the botany department, there was E.J.H. Corner, the professor of tropical botany, who had written, had spent years in Malaysia and was an expert on the evolution of palms and tropical flora. There were people who worked in ecology in the field. The botanists who, Oliver Rackham, who knew the names of plants and the history of the countryside and so on. People who actually knew about plants, who you could ask what the name of a plant was if you didn't know, but uh, these were all uh, replaced in the 1980s and 90s and 2000s by molecular biologists who couldn't recognize a plant and you know, who knew nothing about that they were chemists or they were physicists, knew nothing about plants or ecology or tropical plant families or fungi or anything like that. It was all a matter of molecular biology and molecular details. Um, and they changed the name from the botany school to the Department of Plant Sciences. Um, and that's happened in various other universities because botany yeah. sort of old fashioned, it sort of redolent of 19th century clergymen actually knowing the names of plants. Um, uh, whereas plant sciences is sort of hard molecular stuff all about genomes and, and so on. So this um, takeover basically of all of biology by molecular biology uh, forced it in old style biologists who were much more holistic in their thinking and more ecological in their thinking um, were died off or was squeezed out and so one was left with this very narrow reductionist approach the same happened in medicine where medical research became a matter of looking at molecular details of drug activity or genes or genomes and, and so on. It's very symptomatic that the Medical Research Council has closed down most of its institutes and centralized them at a vast new center right next to St. Pancras Station, the Francis Crick Institute. Well, Francis Crick had a PhD in physics. He was a crystallographer who worked out the structure of DNA but he was never a doctor. He never did any medical research. And he's the founding father of British molecular biology. So um, the Francis Crick Institute, it says on the, on the, over the door what it's about. It's about molecular medicine. Um, and, you know, they're not going to be studying Chinese traditional medicine, acupuncture, whether homeopathy works beyond placebo effects and, and, and Reiki and, anything like that in the Francis Crick Institute. Um, so there's a curious way in which biology went in the opposite direction to physics into this much, much more narrow reductionist materialist direction. And many biologists were militant atheists. Francis Crick himself was a very militant atheist. And their aim was to prove materialism through biology to get rid of the last idea that could be anything like a soul or anything mysterious about life that couldn't be explained in molecular terms. It was an ideological mission. You don't meet so many of these ideologically driven people now, but yeah. there were a lot of them in biology in my generation. I mean, Dawkins is one example, Crick's another. Uh, Lewis Walpert, the late Lewis Walpert was another. They were very driven by a kind of atheist materialist agenda which they thought was the truth, and that, they, that through biology, um, humanity could be freed of superstitions like a belief in psychic phenomena and liberated from the shackles of religion into the sunlit uplands of rationalistic, mechanistic science.